someone was like, man, why didn't you just do an oyster farm? That's what I did. And I thought, man, well, maybe that was a thing. But then I thought, you know, I don't want to become an oyster farmer. No, I'm allergic to shellfish. So I want to keep this oyster penis. Yeah. Head. We can't sell that one. That's Larry. Yeah, we would be horrible farmers. Welcome to the Turning Profit Podcast. Heather, so great to be here once again. Yeah, we mix things up, right? I'm on the other side. Are you, what do we do? I podcast in each other's chairs to see how it feels. Yeah, a day in Heather's shoes. Or in this case, Heather's chair. Heather's chair. Yeah, I don't think you'd fit in my shoes. No, I don't think so either. Yeah. You wouldn't want me to wear your shoes either. That could be interesting, right? But yeah, I don't think so. So Yeah, yeah. so Heather says that this is her better side. I don't know. I told her I think they're both good sides. And then she told me I'm lying. So... I don't think I'm lying at all, but anyhow. I can see better too. That's the other. Okay. So, that's good. But Who needs yes, to see? I know, right? Who cares? What are we talking about today? Well, today's topic of the podcast is breaking down our letter that we send out to generate all of our deals. So we're going to go through it uh, piece by piece. And then also we'll let you know where you can actually get a copy of our letter so you can use it yourself. Cool. Okay. Um, get as many deals as you can. That, right. that would be great. Okay. So what do you have for um, in the news today? I like I told you, you're the one that does the news for us. I know. You know what? There's nothing really to talk about. I mean, there's a lot to talk about, but mm-hmm. I feel like at this point, let's just get into the letter. It's just like okay. the same old. A lot of people are talking about how has the housing market crashed mm-hmm. or the real estate market crashed. It'll take a while to know once it has. Right. Yeah. We'll know in hindsight. I right. it's 2020. That's the crazy thing about real estate. You know, you, know, you don't really realize sometimes as you're going through some of this stuff and then it becomes really evident when you look back in the data and everything. I think the big takeaway is whether whatever kind of real estate you're trying to buy, it's kind of like investing in the stock market. Don't try to time the market. Yeah, it's tough to time the market. Yeah. You know, I mean, maybe don't buy at the top. Mm-hmm. And I think you can normally feel when things are at the top. If I was looking for a house for me to live in, I wouldn't wait till, and I mean, because then you're living in limbo. Okay, since we're not going to talk about it in national news, are we going to talk, talk about any of our personal news? It's uh-huh. actually the fact that our Land Conquest training program is fully released. That, okay, that's big news. That's news that we should, we should touch on here. Right. So it's 10 levels of advanced training, in-depth training mm-hmm. about how to do the land flipping business. A to Z. There's nothing being held back on there. It's a training program that if you went through someone else, it would cost you thousands of dollars. But we're giving it away for free. I hate when you say for free. Well, it's, I, it's, no cost. it's not a free course. We're, we're giving it away for no cost. I guess it's yeah, a better way to put it. I feel it. like people think, oh, it's free. Then like, I don't have They're to gonna do it. They're going to say this is junk. Well, you know what I mean? I think people don't value it as much. That's true. Once you start it, you realize this is not just your, you know, it's not a one of those free throwaway courses. It's mm-hmm. a course that you could have charged thousands of dollars for. And it still may in the future. Right, right. If your wife has anything to do with it, you know, because I'm like, you put in all that time and effort, but you're not doing it. I mean, you're doing it out of the you know the kindness of your heart, but how do you benefit from it? Well, we benefit in a number of ways. A few things. Mm-hmm. First of all, I'm looking to train as many students as possible that can go out there and find deals. So then we can partner with our, our students. So we have a, a site that we just launched. It's partnerwithpete.com. And it's a really cool program. It's a lot different than any other land investors that I've seen out there. So basically what we do is you find the deal. We will then take a look at it and you submit it on partnerwithpete.com. I take a look at it really quickly and let you know if I think it's a deal or not. If it's a deal, then I will say, okay, we will fund this deal. And basically we take the baton and run with it from there. I so stop you because like most people... Um, when they partner with somebody, they send the money to escrow. Right. So your partner is the one who just funds the deal. Right. That's their only role, pretty much. They fund the deal and then they leave it to the investor to close the transaction, do the marketing on the resale side, like do the whole process, which is extensive. I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. All the due diligence, hiring the photographer, you know, if you're going to do any value add stuff, you know, that's uh, something that we pay for as well. So we pay for the deal. You know, we, you don't have to send any money and then we take care of everything else to get the property sold. And then at the end of the day, we split the profits 50, 50. You have no risk. You know, if there's anything that were to go wrong in the deal, that's all on us, not you. I think it's a really innovative program. And we're only able to do that because we've got a great team built up doing all these transactions ourselves. So we'll continue to send out mail and generate all the deals that we can. But we also are hoping to partner with as many students as we can uh, in helping them close their deals. And then everyone wins. You know, we each get 50% of the profit. Okay. And then it also uses our um, software. Oh, yes. Yeah. Our, our uh, Land Conquest software, which is going to be ready very soon. It's, uh, I call it more of a Land Conquest business system. So it's, it's thank you. Yeah. yeah. So it it does a number of things and it's infinite kind of possibilities what you can do with it. But I've got some some really cool things planned for that that is going to be released really soon. 
And obviously that is going to be a paid, you know, service that if you're interested in, you're, you're really looking to build a, a real business out of this land flipping thing, then you might want to take advantage of that. If anyone who's partnering with Pete, their deal would go through our business system. Mm -hmm. That business system will also be available to others yes. as a side thing. So you could actually pay to- To get it to for your own that. business. Mm -hmm. And when you say it's infinitely, it's kind of customizable, is that we are going to be sharing the exact system. Like we, our whole- every tweak that we've made to it, everything that we think of that is needs to be on there will be on there when you get it. However, if you think of something that you want on there too, you'll have access to somebody that can implement that for you. Yeah, exactly. You have access to our tech team who basically can build out anything that you can dream up, assuming that the platform is capable of that. And the other cool thing that I think will, will really be something unique over time is we have a separate community basically for people using uh, the business system. So the community will be there so we can, you know, share tips and tricks and things like that. But also it will allow the platform to get better and better over time. So say someone comes up with a great idea to do something within their business, they share it within the community. We, we, you know, we make it happen on the platform. Other members in the community can also benefit from that advancement. So over time, it's really going to build and uh, be a really kind of cool thing. So that was the first thing was that we'll offer it like you train people so that they can find the deals you can offer the the funding part right mm -hmm. okay and then we'll have a software business solution mm -hmm. and then and then also a higher end mentorship program now this is not going to be cheap and it's not going to be for everyone because it's not cheap but for those looking to kind of take that next step and really build a, a real business out of this we're going to have a mentorship program with a lot of accountability another community involved with that as well so the whole goal is for you to build as as big and as as good of a business as you can and then we're going to help you along the way with that mentorship program so right. that's not ready yet either but that will be maybe in a couple months or so okay well, we'll talk about all those um later but where can they find information about this well, the first thing to do is to get, if you're not in our Land Conquest community, definitely go there and sign up. It just takes a, a minute, um, landconquest.com. And there's a bunch of orange buttons on that page. Just press one of those orange buttons and that will take you to the community. It's hosted on a separate platform than Facebook groups or anything like that. We don't, we don't have a lot of good things to say about Facebook groups. I mean, we, we have a lot of experience with them, but uh, there's a lot of issues with them. So we built everything on a platform that's completely different, completely different from, from Facebook. So we can, there's a lot better interaction and a lot more tools in there that uh, will help our students out. Yeah, there's no drama. There's no distractions. It's just, you're there to learn, to grow, to support each other yep. and to make money. Yeah. So let's get into this letter. So this letter is something that you created um, you've fine-tuned and tweaked and all that kind of stuff. It's a letter that you send to landowners to express interest in buying their properties. Exactly. Yeah. This is a two-page letter. It's in one of those envelopes that looks like it's almost like a bill that you're getting or something. It's kind of a, it's a white envelope, number 10 envelope, they call it. And it's got two clear windows on it. So, you know, it's kind of nondescript. So hopefully people will open it. Uh, we've had some, uh, a lot of research that people have done over time. Those seem to get opened the best. That's kind of the first thing. It's a two-page letter. Page one is explaining who we are and why we're contacting them and what we can do for them. And then page two is simply a uh, purchase agreement that is an offer for their land. So there's there's a number of ways to generate deals in this business. This is the most effective, in my opinion, you know, is to do an actual offer. And it you know sometimes this offer is right on. Sometimes it's too low. Sometimes it's too high. But it's a discussion starter in a lot of cases. Right. If someone's interested in selling, this would get them to call you. Mm -hmm. yep. And then you can go from there. Mm -hmm. And if someone's not interested in selling and they get this letter, two things happen. They throw it away because they don't yeah. care. They're not interested in selling. It's not a big deal. Or they freak out. <laughs> yes. We do have a very small percentage of people that are highly offended that we sent them an offer in the mail. And they're probably highly offended because they believe that their property is worth way more than what we're offering them for their property. Right, but you've even had some that have just been like, I have no desire to sell. Why in the world would you would you send me a letter? Mm -hmm. Like it's extremely intrusive that mm -hmm. you sent him a letter. I think it's kind of funny. I guess I don't like getting unsolicited text messages mm -hmm. that yeah. I get or even phone calls. But like a letter in the mail, I throw away so much junk mail every day, so mm -hmm. it doesn't phase me. Right, and then you have to remember too that people, even though there's a real value on a piece of land that can be, you know, sorted by the price that the market's willing to pay. Some people's properties have such high sentimental value that there's no offer number that you could have offered to them that would have satisfied that. But the, the most important thing, the first step to any of this is getting it them, getting this letter to them, getting them to open the letter, 
right? And so if you you figured out all those things, you know how to get it sent to them, you know how to get them to open it. I want to touch on the envelope that it comes into. Um, it that's exactly what I think of too when I see like every once in a while we'll get one, and uh, or if you'll send a sample or a test one to us, and I'll get it. And the fact that it's not like the pre-printed envelope that does that looks like scammy to me. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's, it's actually like where you're you mean like the fake handwriting or something. Yeah, like uh huh. Mm-hmm. Like where yeah. it's just I can tell it's just like pre-sort. It's like. I don't know. I just look at that. I most of them don't even open it. Mm-hmm. But the ones that do have the opening, like the little cutout on the top and then the one right there, I think that's perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It seems to work the best. I mean, obviously this is the thing. There's many different pieces of mail that you could test over time and kind of really work this, but this has gotten great results for us. And, uh, you know, who knows? You may have a better way to do things than us. Right. You can uh, test things. Right. Yeah. I mean, and you should. Um, okay. So now we've we've sent it to them. They they opened up the envelope. The first thing that they see yep. is... Page one of this letter. Okay. So if you want, I can kind of sort of mm-hmm. read off some of these lines just so, and then we'll break them down one by one. Uh, first of all, it's got their information. It's got our information at the top, you know, who we are, like our, our company name or address and that type of thing. It's got the date that it was sent out and it's also got a reference number. And the reference number is something that we generate on our end and it's unique for every single property. So that way when someone responds, then we can quickly look it up by that reference number and see, okay, here's what we offer them. Here's what the property is, all that stuff. And then it goes into real basics. Like, Do a lot of people like not have the reference number? Well, generally they do have this. Uh, sometimes they read it off wrong because it's a six digit you know, reference number. So sometimes that gets messed up. But typically if we have their name, then we could search for it as well. The reference number definitely does help and it does make it seem a little bit more official, I guess. Mm-hmm. But if they don't have that, we could typically track it down by getting different information from them. It's got their information on it, like their name, their mailing address, city, state, zip, all that stuff. And then their name, and it says mailing name in this, like Ron Jones. And then it says, we'd like to purchase your 23 acre property in Smith County, Nebraska. Nebraska. And then we included a purchase agreement on page two that outlines our offer. So the point in all this is, first of all, it cuts right to the chase. It basically says at the beginning, hey, we'd like to purchase your land. And then the second line is, we've included a purchase agreement on page two that outlines our offer. So I think if if people own a piece of land and they're at least it's a thought in their head, at least they're curious, maybe like, hmm. A, an offer for our, for my property? That's interesting. I forgot all about this piece of land. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the case a lot of times. Mm-hmm. And then we go into talking about some things about our, our company. You know, We're a professional real estate investment company that buys land directly from property owners. We pay cash and close quickly. So that's our thing. And no long drawn out marketing processes, anything like that, that they you know probably think of negatively when it would come to buying or, or selling land. And then, you know, we go into some of the benefits to them. So in, in our case, in this letter, we say, why sell your property to, you know, our, our company name? And then we close quickly as soon as the title work can be completed. We pay all closing costs and including property taxes. We're experienced, professional, and the easiest buyer that you'll ever deal with. All those things are planned out specifically. First of all, the first line, we close quickly as soon as the title work can be completed. Now, we say that specifically because we want them to know that we're dealing with the professional closing company in order to purchase this property. We're not going to be coming there at the house and asking them to sign the deed at their kitchen table, you know, and we're going to give them a check or something like that. That oh, sounds kind of, yeah, that sounds yeah. kind of, kind of scammy in a way, if you ask me. So we want them to know that we're a professional company. We're doing it the right way. We're going to use a closing company that's going to protect their interests as well as ours. That's kind of the first thing. And then the other thing that, that we, state in here is that we're paying all the closing costs, including property taxes. A lot of them are worried about that, huh? Yeah. Like they may have, you know, they may not have paid the property taxes for a couple of years and they don't want to, they don't have the money even sometimes to come out of pocket to pay those taxes. So we, we kind of squashed that objection right here from the beginning. The other thing that's interesting about this line is I kind of think about it similar to the way that Amazon does things with Prime. The Prime program, they pay for the shipping. So it kind of is like you you pay the price of whatever it is, but you're not paying the shipping on top of it. It's kind of the same concept. We pay all the closing costs. We pay all the, and including any property taxes. So, so we're trying to make it- number. Simple. Right. And also, so this offer number that they're getting is the number of cash. Yeah. That's the, the amount part. that they should walk away with. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. And then the third line, we're experienced, professional, and the easiest buyer you'll ever deal with. 
And again, that's just kind of talking about the ease of the purchasing process. We know what we're doing. We're very professional. We're not going to do anything scammy and we're the easiest buyer that you'll ever deal with. That's right. that's how we want to position ourselves. And obviously we're not paying top dollar for these properties. So we need to be able to offer them something else, uh, which may uh, make the make it worthwhile in their minds. We're the convenience buyer. Yep. If they want top dollar, then they would have to do all these things that we are doing for them. Yep. I, you know, you use this analogy all the time because you know this this comes up quite a bit. Like, well, why would they even sell to you? We make it easy. We're the convenience buyer. It's no different than when you have a car. You want to go get buy a new car. Mm-hmm. You could obviously take that car, retail it yourself. You can get it detailed. You can fix any little issues with it. You can get new tires, new brakes, everything. Make it like retail ready. List it for sale yourself. Deal with people coming over to your house and checking out this car, figuring out how to do a test drive with these people, and then figuring out how to pay off your loan and, and get the paperwork right when that's done. So you can go through all that process one step at a time if you know what you were doing, and you can get a higher amount for your car. Mm-hmm. The convenience way to do it would be like, hey, I'm going to go buy a new car. I'm going to trade this into the dealership. It's very easy. They're going to give you a number. You're probably going to be not super excited about the number that you're you're going to get. You know that you could get more if you sold it on your own, but nine times out of 10, people are going to go that route rather than taking the route of doing it themselves because it's a lot of hassle. So selling your land would be would be no different. You typically have to go through a long marketing process. You've got to interview agents to find the right one, someone that's going to actually put into work to actually sell it, and then you know wait for that right buyer to come along and know how to negotiate deals when they come in and things. So you know we take all of that out of, out of it for them. And the other thing is to some of these properties, a lot of these properties that we're buying are in them. You know the kind of sweet spot is the twenty to fifty thousand dollar price range, purchase price range, and it's it's actually really hard to find an agent that wants to. Re, you know, spend time to actually resell those properties because they don't make a lot of money. The right way. To, to, to do it the right way. They're listening right. and they'll just throw it up there. And believe me, it's actually, if you call the wrong agents and stuff, most of them are going to be like, yeah, you know, it's just not worth it for me to, to even sell that property. Mm-hmm. And even, you know, a lot of investors deal with the price range below that even where they're maybe buying properties for 5000 or something like that. Like there's, there's very few agents that want to like spend a lot of time marketing a Twenty thousand dollar property or something like Especially, that. So it's a lot different, right? I mean, we we pay more. Our commissions that we offer are higher. But what's an average? I can't even remember what an average land what is. And you know, six or seven percent maybe is the average. And then they have to split that with right. the buyer's agent. So if you're talking a twenty thousand dollar property, six percent that would be twelve hundred dollars in commission. They may get a 70 30 percent split with their broker. So what is that even like? That's six hundred bucks or so, seven hundred bucks. You know, yeah, that's what they're getting. But so if you think of it that way, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I mean, a real estate and people I know I see talk all the time about how real estate agents oh they get paid all this kind of stuff. You have, unless you've walked in their shoes, you have no idea. It's it's tough, you know, right. to to do all this work for a you know seven hundred dollar commission. That I mean, I don't. That's tough. That's tough to get by. No, it doesn't make sense because mm-hmm. then you're taking time away from a different property that would, you know, make more. And right. It's not like you. They're not trying to be this way. It's just that when you run the numbers, they have to do what actually keeps them afloat. The actual important part of that is that's the entire commission. That, yeah, exactly. So if they list it on the MLS, another agent comes and brings the buyer, they've got to split that with them in some way. So they may be giving away half of that commission to another agent. But then you forget too that a lot of them, their errors and omissions insurance is paid per property. Per deal, yeah. per deal and that might be $250. And so now you've They've made what, 150 Like It's very hard to dispose of these properties if you're just a regular person. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Be. And a lot of times it's just, you, you think of all the paperwork you have to do, all the headaches you have to do, and then that agent's going to be like, hey, walk the property with me, show me this stuff. They might not know. Mm-hmm. A lot of times they inherit these properties or they buy these properties thinking they'll build, you know, and they did this 40 years ago or an investment or something. It's just not even top of mind for a lot of people. They get the bill every year and they're like, why do I still have this piece of property? Right. So there's a lot of reasons. And then you get the people who are, you know, this is this is their dream piece of property. They're going to build on it, all this kind of stuff. Obviously, you, they're not going to sell. And so you just kind of have to let the negative, which are not that many, really. It's very, very few. That's right. Yeah, it's a fit for some situations. And many situations, you know, people aren't ready to sell or they 
don't like the price or whatever, but for certain situations, it does make sense. And that's that's their whole niche. Right. And this letter is not to convince people who have no intention of selling to sell. No, no, it's not trying to talk anyone into it. No. And, and you don't, it's not like you're trying to scam them into, you know, taking their property. That's not, this letter is for people who are interested in, in selling to get your information. Right. That's it. That's exactly. All. So, and also reiterate that because a lot of people be like, someone called me back, they're not interested, but I got this lead. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you don't have a lead. Yeah, this is nothing. You know, like those are the, those are the, those are the ones that you sift through. You know, right. you got to you got to mine through the all the caves to for, in order to find the gems. You're looking for the gems. Yeah, and your job's not to be a creep and try to like talk someone into something uh-huh. when they're not they're not interested. No. Yeah. Okay, so what's the next part of this? Okay, the next part of it is basically talking about how to actually accept the offer. Okay, we've so gone we went second. through, it's got all the information. You said that you've already told them that you want to buy it. You told them that the purchase agreement's on the other side. You went through and you said, this is why you should sell to us. Mm-hmm. And now they're like, okay, and now you're going to tell me exactly how to. Yeah, this is the how-to part. Okay. How to accept the enclosed offer. Give us a call at our number. You could also accept it by mail. And a lot of people do actually accept these by mm-hmm. mail. So they re- return the signed purchase agreement to our address above. A lot of people, that, like literally, they just don't care about this. That's easy right. for them. They sign it and they send it back. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, you know, you'll get some of those that people will sign these and send it back. And then when you look at it in detail, you're like, oh, I don't want to buy this property because, <laughs> it's you know, it's got a major problem yeah. or a landlock or something like that. So that does happen sometimes. So it's not like a binding offer that you send out or anything. You I have always, the ability to. I swear in the beginning you did. You did get an offer back to buy a piece of land and it was completely underwater. Yes, completely underwater. Like there was parcels, you know, you could see the parcel lines and it was off the shore. So maybe at some point, you know, maybe it was dry ground, but. Not anymore. You know. I know that's the one that always comes back to me though. Mm-hmm. I always think about like the reason why it's. Completely- yeah. And I, and I passed on that one and someone was like, man, why didn't you just do the, an oyster farm? Yeah. That's what I did. And I thought, well, well, maybe that was a thing. But then I thought, you know, I don't want to become an oyster farmer. No. I mean, I'm allergic to shellfish, so I don't want to, you know, we're vegan. I don't know if that's the best thing for the environment, but what it really comes down to is we're not oyster. Can you imagine us? Yeah. You got to you stay in your lane, right? I want, I want to keep this oyster, Pete. His name yeah. is Fred. We can't sell that one. That's Larry. Yeah, we would be horrible farmers. Okay. So we say, give us a call uh, by mail, by email. You can take a photo of the side purchase agreement, email it to our email. It's like, just about removing the friction. And mitigating any sort of issue because a lot of people are like, you don't, what if they don't have a scanner? I don't always have access to a scanner. I mean, I do no. my phone, but a lot of people don't know that, mm-hmm. you know? So it's like, okay, take a picture and send it back. And also that's not a completely, I mean, it's a binding agreement, but mm-hmm. it's not like the final one. Right. And so it's, it's not an agreement until it's signed actually signed exactly. by us. So. so it's okay to have it like that. Right. And and then, you know, if the quality is bad or something like that, then we talk to them and we send them a docu sign or something like that. But we get that sorted out. But it's just the commitment, like, hey, I want to move forward. Mm-hmm. It's that initial, like, get back to you. Okay, go on. Right. And then, or by text. So they could do the same thing take a photo of the sign purchase agreement, text it to our phone number. So we give them basically four different options. They can call us, they can mail it back, they can email it us, or they could text it back. Usually, carrier pigeon and in office. I need to enact those. That's that's pretty good. You know what I just realized? What? When we went through the whole thing um, ab- about our personal news, I didn't even say where they could find more information on it. So What's that? Landconquest.com, <laughs> turningprofit.com. Yes. Landconquest.com. Uh-huh. Yes, that, that would be the first place to start, I think, to, to join our community. Also, turningprofit.com has got a wealth of resources on there as well. Turning Profit, obviously the name of this podcast, but that's where we post our monthly income reports. And our monthly income reports, I think, are truly valuable if you're interested or thinking about getting involved in the land flipping business because you can see what's possible. Every month, I do uh, an extensive report, which is the revenue we took in, the profit we did that month, each and every deal that we did, like what we bought it for, what we sold it for, notes about each of these properties. So we try to go in depth as possible just so you could see what this business is about. And if you could see yourself doing it yourself, or maybe you can learn some things. You know, I learn things every single deal that we do. So I try to put those things into the, into that income report, to confirming to myself, but it also you can learn from it as well. Now, what's the next uh, section? And then it basically says, hey, please review page two of this letter to see the details of our offer. Thank you for your time. And then also I have this thing that I didn't initially, didn't used to put this on here, but I actually got another letter from a land investor on one of the properties that we own and they had something similar to it. And I thought that's a pretty good idea. So it says something not right with our offer, submit a counter offer at our website. So they can go on our website 
they can then, you know, fill out this counter offer form, you know, so then they can say, okay, I want to sell, but here's the price I need to be able to sell at. Have so it gets the gushing started. Have they been doing that? Oh yeah. We get a lot of deals put together that way. And sometimes they'll counter offer something that's way too high for us, mm -hmm. but then we'll look at the property and say, hey, for these reasons, this is the best that we can do. And then we end up agreeing to a price. So just because you get a counter offer at a higher price that maybe doesn't work, doesn't mean it's the their only price they're going to sell for. I think a lot of people think that if um, someone comes back at that, that it's just a done deal. Well, yeah. they wanted X amount of dollars. So yeah. it's just, it's not going to work. And it's not the case, just like it wasn't a done deal for you that they countered. You know, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But you want to take every lead to the end. Yes. You know, don't squander your leads. Has anyone entered like $5 billion? Oh, yeah. I get crazy stuff on there all the time. I'll sell it for, you know, like maybe it'll be a 50 acre property and we offer them a certain amount. And they'll say, well, I would take that certain amount per acre. You know, right. so basically oh, okay. what 50 times what I offer them, you know, stuff like that, which, like, which kind of like, a, okay, tough guy messing with me. Yeah, you know, exactly. Trying to mess. Right. With me. It doesn't mess with me anymore. So the second page is your purchase agreement mm -hmm. and it starts with the parcel number. So it's got like the APN, then it has the acreage. You write acreage a lot. Why do you put the acreage everywhere? This is quite common where people own numerous properties and that's how they do it. They were like, oh, this 23 acre property owned on Smith Road or the 13 acres I, uh, I own over there. So that's an easy way for them to identify that in their mind. They may not have the parcel number recognized. I'd right. imagine they probably don't. But they would know like the acreage. Mm -hmm. And then um, let's see here. You have the county, the state, and then your reference number, which you have throughout the whole thing. The next line is the purchase price. So this is what you're offering. Right. Okay. Right. And then you put the closing date. You put ASAP as soon as the attorney title escrow paperwork is ready within 30 days. So, you know, on that thing, the closing date, I would love to be able to close these properties, you know, generally within two weeks would be pretty much ideal. Mm -hmm. But it seems like we're always waiting on the closing company. Mm -hmm. It's because these title reports take a long time to get back in most situations. And uh, it just takes a little bit of time. You know, we're doing, as soon as we get these contracts signed, we're doing a due diligence process, meaning we're sending a photographer out to the property. We're making a bunch of calls to the city and the county. We've done full episodes on this. Just gonna say, yeah. Yeah, so if you're interested to see what our process is about the, the due diligence, which is very important. Right. You basically wanna make sure there's no red flags, something about the property that is gonna cause you to run away from it. Not just walk away, but run away. Run away, right, okay. Yeah. And then you put closing costs and it says mm -hmm. buyer to pay all buyer and seller closing costs, property taxes, city, county taxes, attorney title fees, title policy, et cetera. And you're just making sure that they know that it that that truly is the amount that we're, you know, going to them. Right. And that we cover the rest. Yep. Okay. And then you say attorney title escrow. And then you say transactions to be handled by a reputable attorney title company of buyers choosing at buyer's expense. Yeah, exactly. So we're just saying, hey, we get to pick who the closing company is because we've got our favorite closing companies in all these different areas. And we get to pick who we're going to use to close the transaction. We're going to pay for it as well, but it's our choice. And another important reason why we do it is that we want to make sure that, you know, that there's ac that it actually is a reputable someone who does land, someone that that knows all the ins and outs of it, and they can get it done normally within that thirty days. Yep. And then you put an offer expiration date. Mm -hmm. Now talk about that. Yeah. So we typically put this sixty days out. We generate an expiration date sixty days after we send out this letter. And if you don't put an expiration date, we found that people will never really take that action in order to call you or contact you. Many times this property, like we discussed, is not really top of mind for them. It's kind of uh, really something on the back burner. So by having this expiration date in there, I think sometimes it gets people to take some action, give you a call. This is not a binding expiration date by, right. by any means. You know, someone calls us a year or two later, which they do sometimes, we're not paying attention to this offer expiration date at all. They so, might think of something like, oh, I want to go on this vacation or buy this thing or do whatever. Oh, I could sell the land. Okay. And they might even actually go into thinking, okay, I'll hire an agent to do it. Mm -hmm. And then they start going down that route and realize, well, shoot, this That's is going to take some time. Right. You know, it's going to take a lot more effort. Where's that letter from? Yeah. I've been uh, people that have bought boats, like, you know, they sell us their land to buy a boat or all kinds of stuff. Right. So I, it does, it's just, as, it gives them that incentive to actually do it mm -hmm. as opposed to putting it, I'm going to do this. 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 And then right. they don't do this. Okay. Then the next paragraph is additional terms of this agreement. You say the property is to be sold free and clear of all encumbrances with a good and marketable title and with full possession of property available to buyer at the at the date of closing. Yeah. So I'll break that down quickly. Mm -hmm. 
basically that says that we are going to be buying the property with a clear title, meaning that there is not some title issue. So it's just kind of, we go through this closing process to ensure that we have clear title, but I want them to know that we're not going to buy a property with title issues. The other thing is that we get possession of the property at closing. That's, that's just standard. So obviously you don't, you wouldn't buy something you wouldn't get possession of at the end. No, but they might think, well, I use it for hunting in July. Yeah. Yeah. And I've had people ask me that kind of thing. I'm like, no, we can't do that. <laughs> right. So that's not going to work. Um, or they have some, they're growing something on it, mm-hmm. you know, and, and these things are actually that you could work out if it makes sense. Mm-hmm. Like someone that might be, have planted something on it and I need to harvest, I want to, you know, I need to harvest it in July, but I want to sell it in June or eat. there's ways around. That. Yeah. Yeah. That's happened too. You know, like they've had a crop planted, it gets harvested in October. We buy it in the middle of the summer and then they, they obviously can harvest it at the end, you know. No big deal. That can all be worked out. And then the next one is buyer to conduct a full investigation of the subject property to include all physical and legal aspects. If discoveries are made during the due diligence process that the buyer does not approve of, buyer may choose not to complete the transaction without ramifications. Due diligence period to include the entire length of the escrow period until the closing has occurred. Break that down. Okay. So basically, (laughs) this is saying that we have the right to investigate this property. You know, we can go, we do the physical aspects and the all other aspects of the property that we can investigate. And we've got until closing in order to complete our investigation. If we find something during that whole time period, you know, that we don't like, we can get out of the deal without any sort of ramifications. That's what it says. I mean, this is a kind of a legalese way of saying it, but, but in reality, we can investigate the property there's something we don't like about, we can get out of the deal. Buyer may choose at its full discretion to complete and or assign this transaction to a separate entity of its choosing without further seller approval in order to facilitate an expeditious closing. Yes. Yes. So basically we can, we have the right, you know, when they sign this agreement, when we both sign the agreement that we could close it in a different entity, say we have a different trust name or different LLC or something that we want to close in. We can close in any of those sort of things, or we could assign it to uh, another entity of our choosing. And then, that, you know, that that's our right as far as uh, this, this contract goes. So it's really important for someone who is getting a deal funded right. to have that clause in their agreement. I would definitely recommend having a term like that in your letter, your purchase agreement, because then uh, as a deal funder, we get the property assigned to us in order to close it because the title goes in our name. We're sending the money. Point on there you want to really have is the without seller for further seller approval. Yes. Because during the, the escrow period, even if you didn't have any of that clause in there, you could then go to the seller and say, okay, I just need you to approve this. Yeah, yeah, we're closing it with my partner's uh-huh. name under this. And so. 99% of the time, they wouldn't care. Yeah, but they that just one, want it sold. Right, but that 1% might be like, well, no, now right. I want out of it. Right. Now, right. I'm, I'm not going to, we're going to not do this transaction. So. Right. And also, it's just another step the escrow or title has to do that, that takes more time. All oil, gas, mineral rights to be transferred with the sale of the property. And that's not something that we really think about here in California. Not in California. Area. Yeah, not not in this area. Maybe in the um, Northern California, maybe gold, gold mines, areas. Yeah. yeah. But it, it's a big area of some parts of the country where there's oil and gas exploration, mm-hmm. coal, minerals, that type of thing. Sometimes you'll have it where those rights have been sold off mm-hmm. over the years and they just own the land. They don't own anything underneath the land. It's a negotiable thing sometimes. You know, sometimes people say, I'll sell you the land, but I don't own the oil, gas, mineral rights. But we want the default to be that we get those all those rights transferred with us. But in reality, it's dealt with on a case-by-case basis. Obviously, it's better for us if if we get all those rights with, with the property. Right. And then there's there's actually companies that figure out who owns what. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, and that's kind of a gray area. Sometimes the landowners, they don't 100% know if they own the rights right. to it. So if so, they inherited the property, they might not know anything about it. That's right. And, and no one, obviously, maybe whoever this, these rights were sold off to, they never chose to do anything with it. And maybe whoever owns these rights doesn't even realize they own the rights. So, you know, those types of things happen. But we can, you know, if we were really interested in figuring that out, we have hired companies to do that search for us to give us some some more clarity on that situation. And then you could try to buy those back because a lot of these companies now are open to uh, possibly selling back those rights so you can make it whole again. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's okay. an option. Um, and then you close it off with the, our, the buyer's information, our company address, city, state, zip, phone number, and then the seller's information. Now, why do you go through this this little part? Yeah, yeah. So we've got a buyer side and we've got a seller side. So on the buyer side, it lists our company information, our address, phone number, all that stuff, but there's no signature from us. Right. So Why? Is that on purpose? Yes, it's on purpose. 
uh, because we don't have a chance to evaluate all these properties one by one before we send out this this marketing. So, and that's what it is. It's like a direct um, mail marketing. So when uh, someone comes back and they express some interest in this, then we evaluate it in detail. So we want the seller to sign first. If it looks good and we're in agreement, then we will sign it as well. It's not a contract until both parties sign the contract. Mm -hmm. So we've got our information on there, but there's no signature. Some sellers will not key on in on that. They, they will just, you know, sign it and they think it's a deal, but it really is not, not a deal until we sign it as well. And then, so we get there, then the next section is where they sell. Oh, yes. Put. Yeah. The seller side of things, they sign, they print their name, date, address, phone number, and email. Sometimes people don't have all those things, you know, the email sometimes is, you know, some people don't email um, these days kind of crazy but that's that's true they've got what they've got they fill that information in and then they send it back to us or they take a picture and text it to us or whatever the case may be but it's imperative to ask all those questions because there has been times when they have sent things and there's no contact besides their their yeah. address yeah and then you're left literally being pen pals yeah exactly. having sent these letters back and forth back and forth but if, if you get even just a phone number there's a lot more you can do yeah that's right phone number and email are definitely critical if, you know if we can get both of those that's great but yeah we've had situations where they you know they've accepted their offer mm -hmm. and they just put their so address said, down yeah you know so i'm like well okay so i guess we'll sign it and mail it back to them and then with the big we correspond like, please please give us a phone number we right like, we need to give it to the escrow company or the title, you know. Right. And we share our our letter, our this. Where yes. can they find this? Well, that's in Land Conquest. Land Conquest. Yeah. So go to landconquest.com. And then in the community, there's two sections of the community. Basically, well, there's more than two sections, but there's the community aspect where it's kind of like a, almost like a forum where people post a question and we answer questions and all that kind of stuff. Old school message board. Yeah, yeah, kind of like that. But with, it organized better though. Exactly, but with the better features. Yeah. Usability. And, yeah, exactly. And then as well, there's also a classroom section of the community. So that's where all of our training, our training program is in the classroom section. And I think this is in, like I said, there's 10 levels. I think it's in level three or four can't remember off well, the top of my head. Program. It doesn't it's matter. in the program. Yeah. yeah, you can go in there and, and uh, download it yourself. I'd recommend doing some tweaks to it and kind of making it your own. Obviously, change out all the company name and phone number and all that kind of stuff. Unless you want us to get the deal. Yeah. <laughs> it's cool. That's yes, good. yes. But Appreciate that. It's in there. So all you have to do, go to landconquest.com, and then you'll have immediate access to all that stuff. Are um, you ready for some questions? Sure, sure. So, yeah, we do this segment every week on the podcast, and we are answering questions that have been posted in our community. Sometimes I'll already answer these questions. Sometimes other people will answer the questions, but I sort of select ones that, that are very interesting that would make good content for our podcast, and that's why we go through them here. And it also will give you a taste of what's in the community. Yes, yeah, that's right. The kind of conversations. Okay, you ready? I'm ready. Drum roll, please. Okay. Bo says, good problem, question mark. I have no idea if Bo is as dramatic as I am. So yeah. sorry, Bo, if you're not, but hi all. I'm under the contract on my first land property and think the acreage is actually larger than what the public records show. The records show the parcels four acres. However, I had a suspicion it was bigger because the adjacent parcels are the same size on the map and the public records show that they are around six to eight acres. I then used an online acreage calculator to trace the parcel and it does indeed come out to seven acres. The first question is, are online mapping tools accurate? And then he listed a couple ones he used and they all calculate the parcel to be seven acres. So I think I'm good there. The second question, what do I do when, the, when I close on the property? Do I get a survey to map out the property and get an exact acreage and then get it re-recorded with the county? Question mark. Any help is appreciated. Yeah, so this actually does come up sometimes. Sometimes we'll look at the map and, and there will be a number that says, okay, this is a 20-acre property. But then we look on the map and the shapes don't kind of make sense compared to what the neighboring properties are. You know, a lot of times, unfortunately, this has gone the other way for me. Like it'll say... 50 in the acres, record, yeah, I'll say 50 acres. Then I look at it and it's like, this isn't, this doesn't look like 50 acres, like you know, acre. yeah, yeah, something like that. It's like dr drastically different. There's two parts of this the online measurement tools. We use Google Earth for that. So we get, you know, we first of all, we use Land ID in order to look up the property. And that's a, that's an app to kind of get all our information for the property that allows us to generate a KML file, which is a Google Earth file. So it basically, that will then open up Google Earth 
and it'll show the outline of the property on there. And then there's a tool you can select, which will calculate the acreage right away. That, in my opinion, has been very, very accurate. You know, as long as the lo- the lines are right on the map, it's mm-hmm. it's pretty, pretty accurate. Now, how are you going to get credit for this? Say you're being told it's a three acre property, but you think it's a seven acre property. You know, obviously you're going to buy it. And then how do you get that extra, extra value for that, that additional acreage if you're pretty convinced the best way to do that really is to hire the surveyor yeah so and then surveyor is going to that yeah they're, they're going to confirm all that and then it can be recorded and then you'll get the credit for that it, it's exactly probably what happened was at some point the way that the negative way that it normally happens is that normally someone owns a bigger property they sell off pieces of it it gets recorded but then the original one isn't updated right or a lot of things with houses, it'll be this. It'll just be like an, an input error. Yeah, and that happens too. You yes. know, or they won't take into account, um, you know, a room yes. that's not standard. And I've seen that too. The input error thing, mm-hmm. it happens frequently. Like, okay, this is it. We thought it was an eight point seven acre property, but then we find out it's an eighty seven hundred square foot property. Right. You know those types of things. So it's whoever at the county was typing it in, you know, made just a selected the wrong thing. They selected square feet or they selected acres instead of square feet or, you know something like that so right it's uh yeah thanks then your job now is going to be to make sure that actually is updated mm-hmm. yeah. because you're not just going to submit it you want to make sure it goes through yeah the surveyors will then record it with the county as well. oh, okay so they'll yeah. take care of that but you just want to make sure it actually goes through though because right. a lot of times people are human right yeah mistake and, happen. yeah and then if you get the, the opposite way how did yours get bigger than is recorded it could be too that that owner actually bought another piece of property and it didn't get properly annexed so yeah there could be a, a million different things but it's it's good that and that's why you always check mm-hmm. every single time you're making sure that what you think is is part of your due diligence is, right. is it truly this um let's see randy has a question landlocked properties Ooh, i like talking about landlocked Do you? properties okay. yeah does anyone have any experience with properties with no legal He says legal Mm -hmm. access. What extra measures are you taking? What percentage of market value are you targeting on these types of properties, if at all? How difficult is it to get an easement of necessity or other types approved? So this is kind of a broad question Mm -hmm. and there varies. The the rules on landlocked properties vary from state to state, but at at its basic level, a landlocked property is a property that's basically on an island. It's surrounded by other properties. You have no road. You have no legal path or, or legal easement in order to get to that property. I think that's legal because I bet you there's like an illegal road. Yeah. Like there's something that they've been using for a long time that they- Sometimes. Yeah. Or that they just have been walking across because cousin Joe doesn't care right. or whatever. So when he says legal, he's meaning like, I might be able to get onto it, but it's not my legal right to do that. Right. Maybe. Right. And that's why your state rules come into yeah, effect. Yeah. Sometimes some states have a have rules on the books where landlocked properties are, are not a thing. You can go through the process and get that get that legal access on the books. Some states have a thing where like you can legally access your property, but you can't like drive. You can't it build on it. Or, you oh, can't, yeah. yeah. can't do other things like that. Like you can access it for agriculture or mm-hmm. recreation, something like that, but you can't do it, build anything and, and things like that. So each state has its own rules. Coming to the question of you know, how to evaluate or value these properties. We've kind of taken a stance that we don't deal with these properties at all. Now, I know of investors that they love dealing with these landlocked properties. The only way it really works is if you're buying them ultra cheap. Now, like really cheap. Yeah, like 10 cents on the dollar type thing. Like you got to be buying them really cheap. Whereas even if you can never get access, you could still at least get your money back. Yeah, you could hopefully sell it to someone else that'll realize the extreme value there. And maybe they think they can solve the problem. Getting a legal easement or access is kind of one of those strategies that some of those investors use. They they look at it and they say, okay, I think I can get this solved. Maybe they know the rules really well in that state. They've got a good attorney that they deal with, good surveyor. You know, they, they've got the team to, to really figure this out. Or maybe there's a bunch of neighbors and they think that they can pay off one of the neighbors in order to give them some legal access. Or so that- one of the neighbors will want to buy it. And that's, that's Is, the other. Sorry, did I steal yeah. your last? Well, that's okay. But yeah, that's yeah. the other exit plan. Like you've got a bunch of neighbors and hopefully you think one of them, it would make sense for them to buy it because you'll be able to offer it really cheap. And for them, it's like a no brainer. I can right. pick up 20 acres for a small amount. Mm-hmm. Okay. And now their 10 acre property is now a 30 acre property. Right. And actually they could then. And they can give their own access to the Yeah, other. they could yeah. give their own access to that property and sell it off separately if they want. Mm-hmm. Anyhow, it makes sense for neighbors to buy those properties mm-hmm. a lot. But it, you know, it happens a lot. Like none of the neighbors are interested. None of the neighbors have any money. Right. It just, it's a, it's kind of a big gamble. It's a gamble on those properties unless you, you really know what you're doing. 
But sometimes maybe it makes sense if you're buying it so cheap and you want to dedicate the time in order to solving that problem, you might be able to create a ton of value. We've talked about it before that it would make sense for us to have a team member that just does this. Oh, yes. So we can probably make a lot of money on that. Right. Someone who's an expert in the areas that we farm and I haven't used that in so long. That we farmed it. Yeah, it's a real estate term. Yeah. <laughs> okay. If we had someone that really understood that, knew the, you know, had good a- attorneys in those areas too, that was really into researching, that was kind of the type of person that was going to go on the ground and knock on the door of the neighbors and say, yeah. hey, I want to buy a 20 foot section to get access, or do you want to buy this land? Mm-hmm. Because a lot of times people that sell these, they know they that it's not worth much. And right. they're excited that you even want to pay anything because- Because right. they can't even get to the property. They're mm-hmm. like, what am I, what's the point? And people wonder how this happened. It's the same kind of thing. At one point, someone owned that land and probably owned one of the neighbor properties. Mm, yeah, family thing or something. You know, and then they sold the house and then with that land, and then that just chunk of land got inherited through multiple people because someone's like, oh, it's valuable. It's got to be worth something. Yeah, but not if you can't get to it. Right. Okay, so Brian asked, due diligence. Hello, friends and fellow investors. So I have my first four properties under contract and could really use some guidance expertise on the next steps. I'm wondering, what is typically done during inspection period to check my boxes as each piece being a good investment? I'm struggling to find realtors and land brokers who want to give opinions on value. So right now, the boxes I check are comps, topography. Thank you. Why can I never pronounce that one? Flood zones, title searches uh, through title companies, of course. But I feel there is more at play here. One realtor mentioned getting a soil test, which I found is $800. Is this typically, or is this typical to get done on any of the specific properties we buy? This was was a residential quarter acre lot. Okay, that's important to know because if he's telling you to do that, it means it's probably on the septic. Mm-hmm. And he's probably like, you have a quarter acre lot. Yeah. You need to get it tested or it's worth nothing because you can't build on it. Not nothing, but go on. Yeah. So there's a lot there. We have a whole episode on this. Yeah, we have a whole episode and we've got an entire level of our training program as well that's all dedicated to due diligence it's an important part of the process and you give an actual checklist an actual checklist yeah so you our can just checklist, use our I checklist guess. and just don't worry about cre- recreating the wheel yeah that's right that's right this is a couple of things to break down on that first of all do you want to see it so you know i get it i mean like you're doing a lot of the things that we do there are some other things like you want to check about utilities first of all you've got a quarter acre lot that you're dealing with this is really the only use for a lot like that unless you're in the middle of a city or something, is that it's going to be a home site. Right. There's no room for air on this. Right. You have like a quarter of acre. It needs to be able to do everything you need it to do. Right. Easily. That's right. You're looking at it as a home site. Mm-hmm. So if it's not buildable, then what are you going to do with it? Right. No one's going to use that for recreation. No one's going to hunt on a quarter acre. Right. No one's so, going to grow. Yeah. Your your realtor that you're talking with said, gave you some good advice. Uh, you know, if it's an area where there's all, only septic systems, then you're going to want to make sure that it will pass a perk test so you can get a septic system there. That's like one of the big hurdles for, you know, these type of um, residential building sites. And so $800 is pretty reasonable, right? Yes, it is. No, I don't know what the purchase price of the property is or the price range or anything right. like that. If it's a two thousand dollar lot, you know, I don't, I don't know. But you want to, you want to go through the due diligence to make sure it's a buildable property. If that's that's the way you're going to be reselling it, I would just direct you to the land conquest um, level. Yes. I to, I yeah, I think level seven level is seven. all about due diligence. And then we actually did a whole podcast on that. So go there. And yeah. that, that'll take you there. Okay, we've got one more. I want to squish it okay, in. Real quick. Squish okay, squish it in. Squish okay. it in. This is from Art, and I love this. Okay, so anyways, he says, Le- uh, lease land, what's the value? Hmm. And he says, hey, conquerors. Yes. I like that. I'm going to make an offer on a nice 40-acre agricultural lot in PA that is being leased by owner to a farmer. Once that you know the amount it is leased for, how would you take this into account when determining the market value of the property? I'm having difficulties trying to generate my offer. Thank you and happy 4th of July, y'all. Okay, so I wonder what part of PA, because you're from Pennsylvania. Right. So I like kind of need to know. Right. And then the other thing is, I bet you that it has absolutely no determination on the value whatsoever. You are correct, Heather. Thank yes. You. Do I get like a uh, star prize? Yeah, yeah, you do. You know, really the agricultural land you're not going to get rich off of leasing that land to, to a farmer. Uh, they're not paying top dollar. It doesn't make sense for them to pay top mm-hmm. dollar because they, they don't have these huge profits built into their operations. It sounds backwards, though, because they're providing a value. Like, we need food. I know. Right? We need farmers. We need all this. So you think there's got to be value in it. And then you find out it's subsidized. And, right. And there's all these other advantages and that it doesn't make sense. And then you're kind of left like, what else in the world doesn't make sense? Right. Well, yes, there's a lot of the, this world that doesn't make sense. First of all, I... I before I get into answering the question, Art, is? Art, yeah, Art is in our community. He actually lives in Italy. 
and he flips land in the United States. He's Italian, like grew up there, and I think he's in the Navy as well. So the, the Italian Navy? Yes. That's so crazy. Isn't, isn't that amazing? He flips land in the U.S., mm -hmm. living in Italy. Like he's a resourceful guy to be able to do put all this together, and uh, I, I was just just very impressed. I don't want to botch his last name, but I bet, I bet it's super, super cool Italian pronunciation. Paterzo? I, mean, I, I feel know. like it's got like... Well, anyhow, so we'll, we'll get into this, but... but Pretty cool art, that, but yeah, that also shows cool. that you can do... You can do, do it from anywhere. So we've bought and sold a lot of properties that had been leased to farmers. Mm -hmm. And farmland is actually very desirable in a lot of markets in the country. So if you get a, you know, a lead on a piece of farmland, uh, generally there's a lot of this big buyer pool looking for these type of properties. Now, uh, depending on what region of the country, Actually, there's big funds that only buy farmland. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a big thing, you know, trying to accumulate large parcels and accumulate farmland over time. Because as they say, with land, you know, they're not making any more of it, especially in the United States. And it's, uh, you know, maybe China's making some land; they're building those islands, and in Dubai, they're making those islands as well. But on this on this thing, first of all, farmland is desirable, so you, you take that first. And the second of all. In order for, for it to be to remain desirable, it has to be continually farmed, or you know maybe left fallow for for a season or something like that. Fallow. Yes, but you can't. What in the world is fallow? Just like you don't farm it that year. Fallow. Yeah, I think that's what it's called. Never heard that before, but okay. I'm going to Google it, Heather. Okay, well, if you own farmland. It's good to have it actually being farmed. Right. Well, and there's tax benefits too, right? A lot of Yes, in a lot of places, yes. You'll lose that if you drop the, the farm. If you drop that designation, definitely. These farmers are not going to pay you a lot, but what happens is they will plant in a certain season, generally in the spring, and they will harvest in the fall. So you've got a season where they're actually using this property for active farming purposes. And then after that, obviously, the field remains just a field, you know, during the off season. So generally these farming contracts are pretty, you know, not a lot of paperwork involved, but maybe a one page type of type of agreement, very simple. And then they basically are releasing it during that season. And so they, they do the upkeep of the land too. Exactly. So they're, you're, they're actually like, I don't want to say guarding it, but you know what I mean? Like they're actually keeping it in a good state. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and then you have the situation where, you know, with the, with land flipping, depending on when you buy it, you know, there could be a lease, an active lease on the property at the time. But, you know, say you're buying a property in July, like when this episode will come out, and maybe, you know, 30 days until you close it, so it'll be August, right? And then you put it on the market, and then you market it a little while. The season, maybe the harvest is in October sometimes, so it's going to be very little inconvenience to the end buyer. And typically, the end buyer is either going to want to farm it themselves, mm -hmm. or they'll probably want to lease it out to a farmer as well. It's, it's very rare that they would take that. Yeah, not very rare, but if it's in an area where there's a lot of development going on, maybe they would develop look it. at to develop yeah. it. But that takes time too, so it might make sense for them to to lease it out another season to that same farmer. Right. Well, so, you get into that. So you're saying like, okay, we get listed in September. They harvest in, in October. Let's say, and it's probably a bigger piece of land, 60 day closing on that would still even be kind of like, right. you know, impressive, but most people would understand. And then the other thing too, is if a farmer has already kind of in their brain decided that that piece of land they're going to, like, it would be disruptive to a huge system. Right. You're hurting the farmer, you're hurting the end game. So it's like, if this has already been going on, it's it's nice not to jump in there so close to the whole harvest situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, you can basically, you can do your your own thing really with it and it's not going to get in the way that much is what I'm saying. Right. So. And then, okay. So, but when we talk about value, it actually doesn't really take into account, even though there are benefits and stuff and some people are looking for that, it doesn't normally create like a bidding frenzy mm -hmm. if it's just regular farmland, right? Right. Yeah. So you want to look at comps. You're not even, so you do it, you'd value it the same, the normal way. You don't really add on or anything because it has its farmland designation, correct? Exactly. You're looking at comps for other pieces of farmland of similar size in, in mm -hmm. the similar area and the similar quality of soils and everything. So that's kind of, that's kind of the thing that you're looking at. So the the fact that you've got income on there, typically with commercial property, you're valuing that on the income. And obviously this is semi-commercial or income type property if you're leasing it out as farmland, but it's valued in a different way. Right. It's still, you compare farmland to farmland, not like, well, this one had tobacco, so it gets- mm -hmm. Yeah, the I income mean, is better of this. Yeah, yeah, so you don't really take I the income into consideration as much, unless it's a weird situation, maybe. Right. Um, we did sell a property one time in Northern California, and she had said that it might be a weed grower. Not, I don't know if the person that bought it, but she said that that's like, in, I wonder if Northern California still has. Yeah, there's some areas up there where I think that's that's a big thing. 
but I don't, we don't really get involved in that market. No, but it's another specialty thing that maybe if you figured out what certain things, like if you wanted to get into that, mm-hmm. or if you wanted to just do farmland, mm-hmm. that would be another niche that you could probably narrow down and really be yeah be good at it. Yeah. But again, it's kind of like the um, the properties that are lo- landlocked. Mm-hmm. Like you you need to be a specialist to really do well in these. Exactly. Other than farmland, you can still it's not as much. But yeah. Anyways, okay, so that is it for today. Yeah. For this week. Where can they find you? Okay. Again, uh, landconquest.com is the best place to go and join our community. We'd love to have you there. Uh, Our YouTube channel, we're really putting in a lot of effort into releasing great content on there. Obviously, we post all of our podcasts on our YouTube channel, and you just find that by at uh, on YouTube. You just go to at turning profit, you know, like the at symbol type thing. And they got that. Turning profit, and it'll pull up. We also post our income report videos on there as well. And I've got some other cool content, which I'm planning out that will be released on there as well. So we'd love for you to subscribe on there. We're trying to really get that build up. Turningprofit.com. That's where we post all of our income reports that I talked about. I think it's super valuable if you're a land investor to be taking a look at those and, uh, you know, seeing what this business is all about. And then Land Conquest is where you can join the community. Yes. Oh, uh, and, and Instagram, Reese Peter. I was getting there. Okay. I was going to get there. Yeah. And then you can follow Pete on Instagram at Reese Peter. Yes. And what about you? It's a lovely life, but I don't really share anything land okay. related, but you're welcome to follow me if you like to travel, I guess, okay. or something. I don't know. So we'll be back next week. Yeah, next week. And we'll have another exciting topic on the right. agenda. Um, the other thing too I wanted to point out is that you do weekly, uh, or during the summer, it's not going to be as weekly, but you do. Can you share about? Oh, yes. Yeah, the Zoom calls. And we've got mm-hmm. one that we are recording uh, later today. We're hosting live later today. Mm-hmm. Basically, it's a Zoom call where we break down students' deals. So everyone in the community, they we give them a link to a form where they can fill out information about a potential deal that they're looking at. And what I do on these Zoom calls is I share my screen and I eval- go through the exact evaluation process. What you would do. If what I would buying. do. Yeah. If it was going to be a property I was going to buy, it's the exact evaluation process I go through. And the key there is really to show you how to evaluate properties because there's a so much power that that you'll you'll get from from learning how to evaluate these deals. If you know something's a deal, then you can profit from it. But if you're not sure if it's a deal, yeah, there's no way to to really even you know. So learning how to evaluate properties is one of the most important things you can do, and that's what those calls are all about. And then you can get the link to that and join them by joining tar- um uh, land, yeah uh, land conquest. And our oldest daughter, our older two ones, actually flip land too. Yes. And so our oldest daughter actually helps moderate that. Yeah, she's the co-host on there. Co-host of the deal. The deals. Yeah. I made that up. But anyways, um, okay, so that's enough for this week and we will see you next week. We'll see you then. All right. Thanks.